So, Father, this morning we give you thanks. We give you all the glory and all the honor, Father. Yes, Lord, you are our everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You are our Redeemer, our Savior. This morning, we give you our worship, Lord. We give you our praise, God. In the name of Jesus, Lord. There is no one like you. Tell them there is no one like you. Hallelujah. There is no one like you. We who are the everlasting Father. Thank you, Father, for your presence in this place. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit in this place, Father. Take anything from us, but never take your Holy Spirit from us, Lord. Feel us, Lord. Feel us, Lord. Feel us, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. And as always, we will give you all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the gratitude. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, you may see it. Good morning again. Church, Pastor Alex won't be here with us this morning. He's uh, ministering down south in uh, Pastor Eduardo's arena's uh, church. But uh, this morning we have a treat for you. Our brother Andrew from Iris Ministry is going to be the ministering the word this morning. Amen. And let me tell you something. If you don't know about his ministry, you are more than welcome to shake. They are doing great, amazing work in Brazil. They're going to the places that many people don't want to go, even missionaries. Let me tell you. So I can't wait to hear what he has for us this morning. And let's receive him with the love of Christ and the clap. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good to be here. The first service I stepped up here and nearly ripped my hamstring and my trousers, so came up the steps this time. But it's wonderful to be here. I arrived from Brazil, what day are we, Sunday? Friday evening. And it's been amazing just being here these few days. Second time in this beautiful community. And um, it's a beautiful place where you guys live. Went down by the beach yesterday. And um, yeah, tomorrow I go on to Nashville. But I've been speaking to these guys. Hopefully you'll be coming back more often. And this next time, bring my beautiful family with me. <laughs> so that I have one, yeah, one wife, thankfully. One wife, <laughs> three children. It's not three children, one, yeah, that's, that's right. One wife of 17 years. She's, um, is there any Brazilians in the house? Yeah, oh, they're quiet. There was that Brazilians. Usually if the Brazilians like, yeah. Good. Um, so my wife's from Rio de Janeiro, but we live in Fortaleza, which is in the northeast of Brazil, um, by the coast. Not a bad place to be called when you gr grow up in rainy, smoggy London and um, calls you to the coast. But uh, it's a beautiful place, but it's got its challenges. Um, it's the fifth biggest city in Brazil. It's got uh, three million people in it. Um, but it's known as one of the capitals in, in the southern hemisphere, uh, southern hemisphere for, for child prostitution and sex trafficking. So we have a ministry that works amongst the red light zone. Um, we have ministry in the slums. I also oversee Iris in Brazil. We have about nine bases about 100 missionaries, we go to the rubbish dumps, the inside of the state called the Sertão, which is like the bush bush, where there's not many churches. We plant churches. And basically, we just, love needs to look like something. And we need to manifest it to the places where people have never heard about Jesus. Because Jesus is coming back. He gave us the great commission, the one task, go and make disciples of all nations. That means we need to go. And in Matthew 24, because there's so much happening today, so much happening, so many wars, so much, many natural disasters, and everyone's like, these are the signs of the end, Jesus is coming back, and he is. But what is the main sign that needs to happen before Jesus returns? Matthew 24, verse 14. 
the things that are happening are just the start of the birth pains, but it's not the end. The end will happen when, in all nations, the gospel is preached to all nations, all ethnias, and then the end will come. He's given us a task and we need to finish this. And this is my heart to raise up a people who are willing to lay down their lives for the sake of the king. It's a beautiful way to live your life. And um, it's such a privilege to be able to be here with you guys to share a little bit. Um, we, we have no book here. I have a book here, which you can imagine. It's called God Plus One. There's some being sold at the back. Don't worry. I think there's only a few left. But it, the name of the book is God Plus One, which is basically saying that God is looking for people to partner with him. There's an equation I like to use which says God plus one equals the majority. So if you have, if you're on your own, you sometimes think there's so many problems in the world I can't do anything. But if you understand that God is with you, the same power, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. God needs just one person to manifest. And if you carry him to the dark places and say, God, I must become le less, but you must become more, and release him, it doesn't matter what you're coming against, you're in the majority. It's not about the one, it's about the one who's with you. And we need to start to understand the power that we have and not just be theologically, thank you very much, theologically correct, but live out what we believe, what we declare, what we confess, what we sing. We need to be living out. So this book's at the back. All proceeds go to the mission to help what we're doing. I think there's only 11 books left, so run. But Or I think we'll get some more coming as well to the bookshop. But um, I'm not here to talk about that book. I'm here to talk from the book of all books. My mum does say that that's the best book, second best book in the world, but that's what mum says. But she agrees with us here that the best book, the only life-giving book, is this book that we're going to delve into this morning. So I just want to invite you guys to open your, your Bibles at the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verse 31 to 38. Gospel of Mark 8, 31 to 38. It reads this, Jesus predicts his death. Jesus then began to teach them, which is the disciples, that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the Lord, and that he must be killed and after three days will rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Verse 33, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have the things or the concerns of God in your mind, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the sake of the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can someone, anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory with the holy angels. Let's just close our eyes. I just pray, Jesus, for your help. Spirit of God, I just pray that these simple foundational words will just come alive. And that you'll just awaken our hearts this morning with your truth, Jesus. We just pray, Holy Spirit, you come and speak to us. We say that you're welcome in this place. We, we want to hear from you. We, we expect to encounter you tonight, this morning. 
We want a fresh touch, Jesus. We want to know you. We don't want to just talk about you like you're not in the room. We want you to come and manifest yourself. Visit us this morning. We call out to you, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Breathe upon us. Awaken us. Prepare us. And commission us, Father God, for this week that we're going to be entering into. But I also believe that you're going to touch some people this morning that's going to really be a, a, a separating point that's going to release a calling and purpose on your life, that when you look back, you can say, this Sunday morning, God wept with me and changed the direction of our lives. So we just pray, Jesus, use this little donkey up here on the front. Speak through him. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So here we have some well-known verses. In verse 31, it says that Jesus was teaching the disciples. Verse 30, so it says Jesus was not only just teaching them, but he was talking to them plainly. So we know that Jesus is the best. He's the best at everything. I'm sure if he was surfers, he would be the best surfer. But he's the best teacher. He's the best fisherman. He's the best rabbi. He's the best at everything. And teaching and discipling is what Jesus was best at doing. So Jesus is with his elite group of disciples, the ones that he's chosen, the 12 disciples. He's handpicked them. He says, you guys are going to carry on my legacy when I leave. And he's teaching and speaking plainly to his disciples. And he's telling them in these verses his key message, the core of why he came to earth. So it's quite important that they get it. And he says, I'm going to come while I'm here. And I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. And I'm going to die. And they just don't get it. Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, Jesus, no, 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 you got it all wrong. I've got better plans. This is not the plan. The plan that you are the Messiah. You're the king of kings. You're the, we're going to kick butt here. We're going to cause, we're going to shake this boat and we're going to sit in these amazing places. And so this isn't at the first day. This is, Jesus has been walking with them. Jesus doesn't just have the disciples in the classroom and sit down with a whiteboard. He does life with them. I love Jesus' life. He doesn't just, uh, he, he goes fishing with them. He go, eats picnics with them. He goes, doesn't go shopping because there isn't, but he goes, like, goes to parties with them. And he demonstrates the kingdom. And then he pulls them aside and explains to them one-on-one -on -one what he means. Because very often Jesus talks about parables and it's a little bit like, oh, I don't quite understand what that means. What's that got to do with anything? But it's for those who really go after it. And the disciples, sometimes he pulls them in and explains step by step what he's meaning. So he's really forming the disciples. And here he's telling them such a key important part of his message and his mission. And Peter just doesn't get it. And so it seems like Jesus isn't doing very good at teaching. Like, Jesus, you need to get better at teaching or you need to pick better students because there's something wrong here. They're not getting it. And it, we can see again, it happens in Matthew 10, verse 32. The same sort of situation is repeated. The same conversation, the same teaching part that Jesus is trying to teach the hard-headed disciples something very basic, very simple. He says in Mark 10, 32, it says this, again, Jesus took them aside. So again means he's actually done it three times. At the end of his ministry, he's been taking the disciples. And one more time, again, Jesus sits them down and says, guys, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to die. And he starts to explain that in verse 32, verse 33, verse 34. Verse 35, what happens? What would you think if you have a group, group of friends and you tell them, I'm going to suffer, it's going to be really hard, I'm going to have to die. What, what are they going to say to you? They've got to come around, give you a group hug and say, we're with you. It's going to be all right. We're going to be praying with you. And what, does that, what happens? Verse 35, after Jesus has just told them he's going to suffer and be flogged, verse 35 says this, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us, whatever we ask. If I was Jesus, I would like do a kung fu kick in them. I was like, wake up. I just poured out my heart what I'm going to go through. 
and you come to me, you don't care, and all you want me to do is what you want me to do for you. But Jesus is Jesus. He's not us, thankfully. And he replies, verse 36, so what do you want me to do for you? And verse 37, what do they want? Let one of us sit at your right hand and the other sit at your left hand in your glory. What do they want? They want fame. They want power. They want recognition. They want glory. And we think, ah, oh, this is the disciples. They're like, we would be better disciples than them. And we think, how can they be so slow? But accelerate 2,000 years on. I really don't think much has happened, much has changed. When Peter said to, to, to Jesus, um, don't be stupid, you're not going to ha- go through this. Jesus replied with these words. He said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have the things of God in your mind, but you have the things of man. So this is the root of the problem. It's not that Jesus isn't a good teacher. It's that the mindset of the disciples is so discipled by the world and its values that they can't hear what Jesus is saying. And we need to understand that this happens in my life and your life. And that's very often why the message of the evangelical, speaking Portuguese, evangelical, when the, the, the gospel isn't computing and we're not living it out because it's so opposite to what has been bombarded in us since children at school and growing up. If you've got a, I'm not good at computers, but programming a computer, what you, the input will determine the output. If you, we, it depends how long you sleep, but usually we have like 16 hours a day alive, awake, alive. We have 24 hours a day alive, but 16 is awake. And in those 16 hours, you're getting bombarded. Everything you look at, all the adver- advertising, your friends, everything at work, school, Instagram, Netflix series, you're getting discipled, bombarded by the worldview and the values of the world. So if you spend like half an hour of your very good Christian, one hour a day here, what, how do you think you're going to be more influenced by your one hour zine, one hour, small one hour in the word? Or the 15 hours, it's natural that we are influenced more by the values and the things of man, the, world, the, the mindset of the world. And this is the problem because the mindset of the world is very opposite to the mindset of God. The values of the kingdom of the world is very different from the kingdom of heaven. And so when the kingdom of heaven speaks something, it, we can't compute it because it's so different. And it just goes... We know it says in the Bible, where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. And you think, no, Jesus is my greatest value. But how do you know what you really treasure? How do you know where you put the most value? Not by what you say or what you sing. It's by your lifestyle. What you really value, you can see what you value by how much, where you spend your money, where you spend your time. People who love football, they're spending lots of money going to the football games. Because that's their passion. Where do you spend your energy and your thought life? That will show you where your heart really, really is. And that will denounce what are your values. Because if you come to church two hours a week and maybe have five-minute quiet times, I wouldn't say... Jesus is your highest value. You fit him around to enhance your life so you can, he can help you reach your dreams. And there's a verse here that we all know very well, which is verse um, 36. It says, What good is it if someone gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? We all know these things. We all know we can't run after the values of the world, but we need to run after the values of God. But very often, there's a guy called Jim Carrey, which probably a lot of you know, a great, funny actor from America. He says this, I wish everyone could be rich and famous and do everything they always dreamed of doing because then they will see it's not the answer.
We think if we have all these things, we'll reach satisfaction. But it's not the answer. We work so hard for all these things because the world says it's going to help, but it's not the answer. There's an English guy called Mick Jagger, who's this, the singer of the Rolling Stones. Which you probably, probably don't know too much about them because they're not, the wor- they're not Bethel or worship or whatever, but he is an amazing entertainer. For the last five decades, he's been on the top of the charts with some of the biggest songs. He's sold so many records. He's got fame, got lots of money. He's got the biggest and best beach houses in all these big, big places. He, he's married some of the most beautiful women in the world. He is made. He's got everything. But what is the anthem of his life? What is the song that he's most known for? I can't. Do you want to come and sing it? No, don't. <laughs> I can't get no satisfaction. I try, I try, I try. Can't get no satisfaction. He's a, cat. He's a guy who has everything. But he can't get satisfaction. And we need to wake up. Because sometimes we're chasing after the wind. You spend all the time thinking on how to get these things. Thinking if you get the bigger house, get the better car, get the promotion, get all these things, get all these. But life is so much more. And this verse is basically saying what is real important in life. It says, imagine I'm a scale. On one side of this scale, you have the whole world. So all the dollars, all the pounds, all the euros, all the yen, all the currencies, all the riches, all the diamonds, all the gold, all the oil, all the sports cars, and go on. The whole riches of the world on one side of the scale. On the other side, you have what? One life, one soul. What fa- what's worth more? What if you get all this but lose this? In other words, you're saying one life is worth so much more than the whole world. But we spend all our time running, running, running to get just a little bit and we step over people and think they're worthless. We've got the world's mindset of the world and not the things of God because these things, uh, uh, it's difficult when you speak and preach in Portuguese most of the time. Passageiro, these things, are, they come and go and they're not eternal and we need to live for eternity. Our hearts need to be anchored on eternity, on the destination. When I was coming here from Brazil, I had to get a little Uber to the airport and then had to take a long flight and then rent a car and come here. The the journey was long, but in the journey, what was my mind fixed on? The destination, coming to see Pastor Alex and having your nice cappuccino and nice snacks that you all get for me. It made it all worth it. It wasn't the journey that I liked. And we're on this journey, but we're so fixed on the journey, we forget about the destination. And the destination isn't death. The Bible actually says when we die, we're swallowed up by life because real life starts for eternity. And what we do here determines eternity. And we have our little plans of five years, ten years. And to be honest, we don't even include God in those plans. And those plans are very anchored on earthly things. And we need to live for eternity. And missions only make sense when you live for eternity. It doesn't make sense for me to leave England, London, take my kids out of school in England and London and live in the middle, I don't live in the slum, but work in the slum all the time. Like when I left my job in England, they said, you've gone crazy. But who's crazy? I remember the first girl I took off the streets She was on the streets in two days. I met her after she was on the street for two days. On the second day, she was already... (laughs) I always get these tissues here, don't they? She was already involved in prostitution. And I remember we took her back home. She came from a family of witchcraft. I can't tell all those stories. They haven't got time. But we took her off. And then we go back every two weeks to visit her and her family. And I remember one day we went to visit her. And this little girl, her neighbor, was there. And this little girl, she was like so skinny, so small, so like nervous. Like I spoke to her and she like, like a leaf, like nervous. She couldn't really look in my eye. And I said, do you want to join the Bible study? And she, she said, yeah. So we sat around this table and we had a little simple Bible study. 
And at the end, I was going to pray. And then she, she spoke up in a little voice. She hadn't spoken all Bible. So she goes, I want to give my life to Jesus. And the mum of the, the ex-street girl, she was involved in Macamba. And she started, she doesn't know what she's talking about. She's stupid. She has no idea. And this little girl, she wouldn't give a tweet. She said, no, I want to give my life to Jesus. And the mum was like, whoa. And so we prayed this simple prayer. And she get, this was right, right at the start. She gave her life to Jesus, went home. Two weeks later, came back to do my discipleship with the family. And I said, and where's the girl? Call her in for the Bible study. And Iris Ma, who's the girl we took off the street, she goes, didn't you hear? I said, hear what? She said, a few days after you left, this girl was walking on the sand dunes, and someone took her, raped her, and killed her. I remember going back home in the car. I said, if I just came to Brazil for just that one person, it's worth it. Because one life is worth more than this whole world. Because she's in eternity forever. Because of that simple thing. And we need to reassess the values that we have in our life. And really know what we're running after. We need to understand the importance of stopping for the one. And it all starts from living in that place of intimacy with him. Feeling his heart. Because when you feel the love, you can't just sit down and be indifferent. I think one of the biggest sins in the church isn't I know pornography, adultery, murder. It's, it's this thing called apathy and indifference. Do you know what kills more people in the world? What animal kills more people in the world than any other? It's not a lion. It's not a shark. It's not a, what's that, a big snake. It's a mosquito. This mosquito kills more people with malaria. And sometimes it's the little indifference that's killing more of us. We sit, we see the problems, and we, do, and we need to waken up. And when you start to have his heart, you can't just sit by and watch. Because something burns inside you. I remember I, was, I used to work as a physical therapist in England. And it's a great job because you help people. But also I used to work in the hospital and you can't take your patients home for work. So I just finished at 4.30, went home. I shared a house with other people that are high flyers, earned a lot more money, but they came home like 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night. And so I was at home alone. So what did I do in all that free time? Went in my room, closed the door. E, spent time with him. Why? It wasn't because I live with my parents anymore and they like, Andrew, you need to have your little quiet time. It wasn't because... I preached on Sunday. I, I didn't do any of that. But it's because I wanted to be with him. I love him. I don't understand people who, who sing and shout and dance saying how much we love Jesus on Sunday and then during the week are so bored and can't even spend five minutes with him. There's something wrong. There's a disconnect. Because if you say you love your girlfriend, your boyfriend, you want to spend every waking minute with them. And if you don't, there's not there's probably like don't get married to them. But if you love Jesus, you have gotta be with him. Not because you have to, not because the pastor tells you you need to have your quiet time. No, there's nothing that's gonna stop me spending time with him. When you spend time with him, you start to become more like him. He starts to give you what his heart burns for, and his bur heart burns for people. And I remember that was about 20 years ago, over a period of time, just spending time with him. And we had the, the news, news channels, and it showed a lot about the street kids in Brazil. And when I saw them, my heart started, I started crying. And the English stiff upper lip guys don't like crying. But when you have the heart of Jesus, we need to get tears back in the church. When's the last time you cried? Not over like your own spilt milk or people treating you badly, but cried with a heart of mercy and compassion for people that need help. Your tears will show you a destiny. I cried for these kids. Didn't know them. That was my destiny. God was breaking my heart. 
And so I went off to Brazil, and it was great. I had spent a year with YWAM doing the DTS, getting training, finished nine months with them, came back to England because it was a nine-month program. And I was thinking about going back, but I, I just like, mm, I've done my God slot. Like, it was good, but let's get back to real life. And I still was involved in church. I helped lead the homeless work in church. Went back to physiotherapy. And my real dream, because I never dreamed to be a missionary, my real dream was to be a sports physio for Tottenham Hotspur, which is the best football soccer team in the world. But I started working for one of the best rugby teams in, in England at the weekend. And I was starting to live this dream. And then after two years of working, being at church, getting sort of a little bit more found, uh, grounded and comfortable in my life, God said, I want you to go back to Brazil. And he wrecks my life. Usually the testimony is different. I was in drugs, I killed people, and God came and made my life so much better. I was I've been really well in my life before. I was building what I wanted to do. I was involved in church. I was a good little boy. And Jesus said, come, leave everything, and go to Brazil. The first time it was all right, because it was for nine months. The second time, it's like, no, I can't do that. And I just gave all the excuses. I was good at giving excuses. Who's good at giving excuses to God? Like, send someone else. How will I earn money? Like, I want my family. I want to have a family. I don't want to be in there. And, and it was just that fight for three to four months inside me. I just knew I had to go back. It wasn't like a voice, but you know if you say two plus two, you just know it's four. It's just that inner knowledge and that, that fight within you. I want this, but God wants this. And after four months arguing and fighting, God always wins. I was in the weekend away in the church, and I was on my own again on the floor. And I was just fighting with God. And then just this thought dropped into my mind. If Jesus is real, I don't want him just to be my Savior. I want him to be my Lord. And if he is the Lord, if he's not the Lord of all, he's not the Lord at all. And I started to say, okay, God, I give it all up to you. Take my life. And I started to hear myself say, it was like, take these words back, but I couldn't. Like, it doesn't matter what it costs. It doesn't matter where you want me to go. I am yours. I'm fully yours. Take me and send me where you want. And I, boom, I died. And I say to people that I became a Christian at 12 years old, but I became a real disciple of Jesus when I was 27 years old on that floor. Because Jesus says a definition of what is a disciple. Verse 34 and verse 35 of Mark 8. It says, then he called the crowd. So, so Jesus is always surrounded by a multitude. But Jesus doesn't really care so much about the multitude. He doesn't want a multitude that is superficial, that like him. He wants a few people that are fully devoted. And that's his definition of a disciple. He says, he calls the crowd to him, and he doesn't paint them a nice little picture that he will attract more people to him. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple, they must deny themselves, and they must take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the sake of the gospel will save it. So here it's so simple. Whoever wants to be my disciple, anyone can be their disciple. But there is a requirement. What is the minimal requirement to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? The minimal requirement is everything. You've got to give everything up. If you want to be my disciple... Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. That's scary. We are saved by grace. But the position of our heart needs to, okay, Jesus gave his life for me. What's the, the just response I have? It's not I give him 10% and go to church once a week. No, I give you my whole life. And he says, if you're not willing to do that, you're not worthy. It's not my words, his words. You're not worthy to be my disciple. That's really strong. And then he starts to say, it's when you lose your life that you really start to gain it. And I really felt that. I, I felt I was losing my life. And I told this story in the first service that when I arrived in Brazil, like the first night was horrible. I, my room had no windows. It was so hot. 
full of mosquitoes. I woke up, well, I hardly slept. I was woke up tired, sweaty, full of mosquito bites. And I thought, well, missionaries need to sort of know the culture of the local city. Culture of Fortaleza is the beach. I'll go to the beach. Good, ex good, ex good excuse. So my friend took me to get the bus to go to the beach. And when I was standing at a bus stop waiting for the bus, there was a little street kid. My first street kid I saw. I thought, oh, how cute. And he had like a little thing of glue. He's sniffing under his T-shirt. No, sh no shoes. Dirty. And I was like, wow. I'm going to preach the gospel to this boy. He's going to be converted. And he started walking towards me. And it seemed like he was like looking at me like I had some shine from God on me. And as he came closer, he just started running and he robbed what I had in my hand. He stole from, stole from me. And I was like, what? I've left everything to help these little blessed kids. And the first day, I get robbed. And it got worse because someone, the lo one of the local guys was walking past, saw the street kid steal from me, managed to catch him, pushed him to the floor and started kicking him. And it was, <laughs> you know, I didn't speak much Portuguese, uh, Portuguese at that time. I just said, no, no, por favor. And this kid started like swearing. I didn't understand him, thankfully. But he started swearing at me, got a stone, was ready to throw a stone at me. And the bus came, I got, they pushed me on the bus and we went off. And I thought, what am I doing here? And I can tell you, it's just a good idea. Well, I'd want an adventure, or my pastor told me, the first thing I would have do is get my bag and go back home. But God had given me a calling. God had broken my heart of love. And love doesn't give up. Love causes you to cross oceans. And it doesn't matter how much it costs, because Jesus left his throne and came down and died and laid himself on the cross. If God can do that because of love, how much more do I need to do it? And our idea of love is so twisted because it's so defined by the world. We think love is like this waffy, fluffy, favela little thing that makes... No, it's not like that. We say we love acai... In Brazil, acai is what we eat a lot. We love ice cream. We love Jesus. We love the beach. We love everything. But when you love everything, you don't really love anything. And our love is very se uh, selfish. So one thing in Brazil I love is the red snappers on the beach. You get a red snapper, and I'll take you there and get your red snapper. You can eat a fried red snapper on the beach. It's beautiful. I love the f this fish. But you think, do you really love the fish, Andrew? Because what do you do? You see the fish so happy, like jumping in the water, swimming along. You get the fish with the hook. That's not too loving. Then you get the fish. You, like, you knock it out, bang, it, bang its head, and then you start to peel off its scales, not loving too much. Then you get, to make it even worse, you get it into hot oil and you, you fry it. Is that love? You love your tummy, but you don't love the fish. You love the fish because it makes you feel good. And our love, like, we love God when he's blessing us. It's a very self-centered Love, but love isn't about receiving. Love is about giving. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. You can give and not love, but you can't love and not give. And the measure of your love is the measure of how much you're giving of your life. And we need to understand love is about giving our lives away, laying our lives down, because when we lay it down, we really find real life. And I can tell you, I'm Fortaleza, 20 years and I'm not like a sad, depressed, empty missionary and thinking, oh, I could be living next to the Queen in England drinking tea. No, I'm so happy. I'm so fulfilled. I'm alive. It's not a sacrifice. It's a privilege. It's a pleasure. It makes me come alive. So many tourists go to Fortaleza to go to the beach. I like going to the beach, but you know where I came alive? Where I come alive, what I love? Just sitting on the floor with the drug dealers with the prostitutes, talking to them. That's not your calling, that's my calling. You don't have to do that. But God has called you to something. And when you find that, you will come alive. Money won't make you come alive. But your meaning and your purpose and your calling will make you come alive. Lose your life and live for him. And we need to start doing that in our lives and have our lives anchored on eternity. Because i got friends that the highlight of their week is going to Ikea at the weekend to buy a new carpet or some curtains for the house. God's got so much more than that. 
I got friends that are trying to get to their deathbed safely. It doesn't make sense. We're all going to die. Why try and prolong it and get there safely? Just like live life to the full. Because the values of the world is comfort, convenience, and safety. I remember when I arrived in Brazil, I went to a church that's quite in a nice area. And I, they said, oh, what are you doing here? I said, I've come to work with street kids in the city center. And they go, what? Don't be stupid. You're gringo. Don't speak English, and it's very dangerous. I said, yeah, but what? So? Do you know what Jesus said? He said, when he sent out the disciples, I'm sending you out like sheep amongst. That's minced meat. It's not good. It's not wise. It's not convenient. It's not safe. But it's good. It makes you come alive. And I'm not telling you to go out to the most dangerous place here and just do adventure. Because we need to listen to the voice of the good shepherd. He doesn't say just, he says, I will be, I'm your good shepherd. I will lay my life down for you. I'll protect you. If he doesn't, it doesn't really matter because I'm with him for eternity. That's what Paul says. I'm divided. I want to stay because I want to be a good. But if I die, it's even better because I'll be with him, the lover of my soul. We need to understand the depth of what we believe and live it out and not just water it down to be convenient. We've, we've, we've domesticated Christianity for so long and so many of you, I know I was for many years, just so bored. It's, it's nice to sing, some, especially here, because you're quite good. Like, <laughs> good to sing some songs, good to hear someone speak. speak well, yeah. Do it every week, it's a bit boring. We create, this isn't, this isn't the goal, this is to provide, pro, 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 get you ready for something so much more. And we've domesticated Christian, we've made us nice. Who wants to be nice? Oh, he's a nice Christian. I don't want to be nice. I want to be changing this world. And there's, as my kids were growing up, we watched a film together a, a, quite a, a bit too much over and over again. And it was called Madagascar. And it's about these animals in the zoo in New York. And it's a funny film. Who's watched it? Probably everyone. So it's basically animals in the uh, zoo in New York. And they've got everything they need. They've got shelter. They've got protection. The zookeeper comes with, like, meat for the lion every day and food for the animals. And people are there, like, clapping their hands, looking at their tricks, taking photos of them. They've got a good life. And then one day the zebra is on that treadmill, and it's got the picture of, like, the nature, and he's like on the treadmill looking at nature. And it's his birthday, and he makes a wish as he blows out the candle. And the next day, the lion comes to him and says, Zebra, what is your wish that you made? And the zebra goes, my wish is that I want to go out to the wild. I want to go to the nature. And the lion's like, what? What do you want to do that for? You've got everything you need here. People come and give you food. They take pictures. They love you. They clap your hands. You've got place to live. What do you want to go out to the wild? And above all that, the wild is a dangerous place. And what did the zebra say? Perhaps it might be dangerous, but I know I'm not created for this. I was created for more. And it's so much, you weren't created so just for this. You were created for so much more out there in this world. To be a difference, to be a light. This is so important. But it's not the end. It's the start to feed you and prepare you to send you out. And it might be a little bit dangerous out there. That's okay. You've got the good shepherd with you. And we need to step out of our comfort zone. Because when I'm comfortable, what do I do? I sleep. And we've got so many people sleeping. And when you step out of your comfort zone and do things that you can't do in your own strength, you need to depend on him. You need to give space to him. And it's then he comes and starts to do the supernatural at, at, at Reves, through, through you guys. So that's what we started doing. I was stepping out. I was working the streets. After five years working street kids, I started working in the slums because I realized that the street kids, they didn't really... That wasn't the root of the problem. So we started working in the slums. The street kids helped me to get into the slums. And it was one of the worst slums. It was the worst slum in Fortaleza. 
We always love as Iris to go to the darkest places that no one wants to go. Even people that lived in churches in the neighborhood didn't go in the alleyways that we went, and they lived there all their lives. And so we went in there, and I started making friends. And one of the friends I made was a big, big drug dealer. The second in charge of drug dealers, a missionary in, in Germany now. But when I first met this big, Germ this big drug dealer, we just talked. I didn't have my Bible and started, John 3, 16, you're going to go to heaven and you're going to hell. And, like, that's important. We need to speak and proclaim the gospel. But we need to build a bridge where they can love us and trust us and not see them as a project, but see them as a per person. And so we started a relationship. And then one day after about three or four months, I was walking home and this drug dealer came on his big, big um, motorbike and said, jump on. And I said, okay. We jumped on and he sped through the alleyway dodging his children. Thankfully, he didn't kill anyone. And we arrived in front of his house. And opposite his house, there's another house. And he said, this house is empty. You guys can use it for your project. And it was crazy in the future, this kid, this, this drug dealer, he also had a big car with a big sound system. He used to put Ana Paula Valadão, who's from Brazil, a little worship leader who sang songs on the CD to call the kids to come to our clubs. But he said, you can use this place. And that weekend, I went home. I said, I will pray about it, see if God's allowing us. And I came back. And what I heard is everyone in the slum was saying, how could this drug dealer be letting Andrew use this place right in the midst of all the drugs? Because the previous owner of that house who used to live there, the, the drug dealer had killed a few weeks before on the doorstep because he didn't want him to sell drugs night and day, night and day by the doorstep. And now this drug dealer is saying, you guys can open it. You can use it. And so we felt it was a green light from God. But the, 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 just before we were going to move on, whenever you advance the kingdom of God, there's always a pushback from the kingdom of darkness. And another drug dealer was walking by the owner of that house in his house lives next door and he heard a bit of noise inside so well, that's a bit strange it sounds like a fight so he went in and he saw this lady on her own and she was manifesting a demon and he ran out scared like most of us none of you would but most people do but the problem was it was sunday evening and so he was running find, trying to find a christian to go and pray for the woman but because it's sunday evening all the good christians were at church. So he couldn't find any. And this, this guy, I had been talking with him about Jesus. He hadn't given his life to Jesus, but he knew. And he went back and he said, okay, there's only me. I've got to do something. So he put his hand on this lady and says, I know I don't have power, but I know Jesus does. In the name of Jesus, go. And what happened? Demon left. But... It jumped into another member of the family. And so now he's like, oh, I've got to do it again. I know I have no power, but I know Jesus does in the name of Jesus. Go. And this demon jumped into the four members of the family. And this was Sunday evening. It was Monday morning, <laughs> walking there to open the door to our new place. And this drug dealer, Fabien, he said, can I just have a quick word? I said, sure, what do you want? He told me the story. And I tried not to look too surprised. I thought, yeah, that's what God does. Jesus' powerful name. And I said, do you want to give your life to Jesus now? He goes, I'm not ready yet. I don't want to give my women up. I don't want to give my cars up. I don't want to give my money up. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I said, that's fine. But I'm going to be praying for you. Two weeks later, this guy gave his life to Jesus. <laughs> but why, why am I saying? Because we're full of a room. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands up. But how many of you over the last year have healed people, cast out demons? Because Jesus, very simply, he goes to the disciples, go, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. This is the fruit of a life of the disciples. It says these signs will, will follow those who believe. Not those who have done three years in seminary and are a missionary full time. But no, that's what we need to be doing. Freely you received, freely you've got. And I'm not recommending drug dealers going around praying for people, but if the church isn't doing it, <laughs> someone's going to do it. And we need to activate you guys. We're the body of Christ. Who's the part of the body of Christ? Even if you're the foot, Jesus is above all, all other names, all other powers, all other authorities. We're above, we have all authority. But so often in churches that I go again and again, 
generally is like 5% of the body of Christ is in full-time ministry. So that sort of calculates 5% of the body is being used. Imagine if only 5% of my body is moving. I can't do much, can I? But it's 100%. And we need to start commissioning and giving permission to the body to live out the Christian life. Not just consume, be here and receive and get, a, not that you guys have, but get a big head. But we need to live out. It's not about knowledge, it's about obedience to what we know. And it's dangerous to come here every week and learn and learn and learn and not have the responsibility to obey. Because Jesus says, those who say, I know you, are those who obey me. If you love me, you will obey me. These words aren't for you to just go out and have, be clever. They're for you to live out and obey every day of the week. Because you've got something so special inside you, which is the Spirit of God. So I just want to finish with these verses, which are so special. We'll just invite, there's a beautiful, yeah, beautiful lady coming to, like she's beautiful, but like she releases beautiful <laughs> presence of God. Romans 12, just to finish with these two verses. Romans 12 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, and this is what I'm urging you this morning in Vero Beach. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, we're brothers and sisters, we're the same family. There's no hierarchy. We've got the same father, same access. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We need to live our lives as living sacrifices. That's real worship. It's so easy to be on the altar and, and run off. That's why we're living. We, we can choose not to sacrifice our lives, to run after our own things. But Jesus say no. I've given my life for you. I want you now to give your life for me. And what I want to break here tonight, sometimes we're scared to give our lives to God because we think he's going to cause us to do some stuff that's probably a bit boring, a bit dull, and we're going to have to suffer. But God is a good, good father. As we read in the next verse, it says, his plans for us are good, pleasing, and perfect. Do you believe that? God has good, pleasing, and perfect plans for your life. So why are you so worried to give your life to him and let him live your life? Follow him fully because his plans for you are good and pleasing and perfect. Who believes you've got a calling here, a purpose here on the earth? We all do. But to complete that purpose, you need to know what it is. What is your purpose? What is your calling? We've got three. The highest calling is to love God. We've all got the general calling, which is, Go and make disciples, the Great Commission. And then we have our specific calling. I don't know what your specific calling is, but you need to know. Because when you know that, you're going to come alive. And you don't get your identity from your specific calling. You get your identity from your highest calling. That you're loved, children of God. And out of that, you give your lives away. And then it says, verse 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve that God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Guys, this is summing up all we've talked about. It says, do not conform to the pattern of the world. So much of it, we've been, our form, the way we live and the way we think, we look and think like the world. The only difference is that we have a Bible under our arm and come to church on Sunday. But how do you live in a quiet, quiet place with no one seeing you? My wife, she's great at cooking and she has all these cake tins and she puts the cake mix in. And if it's a square tin, square form, the cake comes out square. If it's circle, it's circle. If it's tri like, it doesn't matter, but the form will determine what the cake looks like. And so often we're informed by the world. We look like the world. We have the values of the world. And this verse is saying that we cannot conform to the pattern of this world, but we need to be transformed by the renewing of the mind, to take out the things of this man, of man things of the world, and put in the value system the truth of God 
Because when we do that and think like Jesus thinks, we'll start to see and understand that it's not good to hold on to our lives. It's best to let our lives go and trust them into the beautiful, caring hands of God who's got a good and a pleasing and perfect will for your life. Because when you live that, you start to come alive. You start to come alive. There's something like, whoa, I was made for this. So many of us, we're we're searching for satisfaction, satisfaction. Can't get it. Do you know why? You're searching in the wrong places. Let go of your life. Let it die. So you can really come alive. We need to be transformed. And this word transform is metamorphosis. And the perfect example of metamorphosis is that you change the form of a caterpillar to a butterfly. You change the way you live. And I've met so many. I'm sure there's none here. But I've met so many caterpillar Christians. They're in the garden of God in this world. And what do they do? Me, 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 consume, consume, it's about me. So you have your lettuces and your cabbages. And the caterpillar does what? It doesn't care when the caterpillar's gone, there's big holes in the lettuce. The caterpillars are pests. It's all about me, all about me, all about me. But then there's the butterfly. What does the butterfly do? The butterflies are beautiful. They fly around, but they fly around. They go to the flowers. And when they see a flower, they go into it and they put their little... I don't know if they... Hello, sorry. I don't know if they have noses, but they they put their mouths and their little fingers and... I don't know if they have fingers. They put whatever they have. They, They put them into the pollen and they like rub their heads in it. And then they fly around. And that pollen, what happens? As they're living their life, flying around, it just falls out. And wherever it goes... It pollinates, it creates life, it multiplies. That's what this church is all about in this city. You can't just me, 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 no. Fly. And what's the pollen is the word of God. Every day, guys, we need to be in here. Why? Not because the pastor tells you, but because you love him. And you're in there, and this is the pollen, and you put your head in there, you put your, and you get dripping with him. So when you walk around in, the, in your workplace, in your school, you're pollinating people with life. Because it's not more about you, it's about him in you. That's what we need to be living. That's the essence of the Christian life. He must get bigger and I must decrease. Because when I die, I fully come alive. And I'm inviting you into a life of full abundance. It's not a sacrifice. It's a privilege to give everything to him because he is worthy. I just want to encourage you just to close your eyes as we finish. And we just invite you, Holy Spirit, to take these simple words and mark our hearts. (laughs) Awaken your bride. Sleep in beauty. Awaken your bride. I just feel there's people that have been sleeping, have been lulled into a, a sleep. And he's awakening you. I awaken your spirit. I awaken your heart now in the name of Jesus for the purposes that God has for your life. Awaken hearts in this place. I speak life, meaning, I pray for all the shiny lights that you've been running around, running after from this world will start to dim in your life. <laughs> and that the morning star will start to shine so much brighter in your life that you will start to run after him and that you'll be willing to lay it all down because he is worthy. He is the pearl of great price. Sell everything with joy, not with sadness, with joy to take hold of him. We just pray that you awaken people today. You're calling people out of boredom. You're giving permission to people to start 
to live out the fullness of their Christian lives. If what I've been speaking about this morning, you just feel testifies in your heart, you feel that's where I am, I, just, I need more. I'm not satisfied more. I, I, I want to get out this domesticated zoo. I'm a little bit worried, a little bit nervous. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know there's more. I know I'm not created just for this. And you can feel this hearts that are starting to burn, start to, to beat fast. If that's you, just stand where you are in your place, please. Because God really wants to mark people. He wants to commission the church in this place, which basically means you've got permission. You've got permission to be like a butterfly. <laughs> but a butterfly without pollen is nothing. And he's calling you back to those quiet times that you've lost, that you stopped having. He's calling you back. He's calling you back. He's calling you back to put your head in that Bible, to put your head in the pollen, to be covered of him, to fall of him. Thank you, Jesus, for each person that's on their feet. Thank you, Jesus. Spirit of God, I, I pray that you mark their lives. Put a fire on them. Put a passion. A passion. New dreams, new visions. Reignite faith. Reignite faith. I feel there's people who are exactly like I was. You love God. You're doing good things. But you've made God a little bit comfortable. You want him up to a limit. You've allowed him in some rooms in your house. But God is calling you back to the things that he spoke to you many years ago. And he's asking you to lay it all down. To give him everything. To make him Lord totally of all you have. And to trust him once again that the plans that he has for you are good, they're perfect, and they're pleasing. Those dreams that you've watered down to make more comfortable, he's reminding you now. He's reminding you now. He's reminding you now. Remind, 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 remind people in this place. The prophetic words they've had. The dreams, the things that once made their heart cry and their heart have been hardened by the distractions, by, by being watered down by wisdom. We don't want the wisdom of this world. We want the wisdom of Jesus. As you give your life, you're going to learn, earn your life. We're going to spend a bit of time just worshipping God. Because I love to speak to you about God. But I also love to speak to God about you. That's praying. I just want to pray with you guys. Oh, sorry. If you just want a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit, not just to make you feel better, to get through the week, but you want to come alive, fully alive, fully alive. You want to lay your life down no matter what the cost is. Come to the front. Come to the front. Come to the front. God is raising up an army in this place this morning. He's going to raise up an army. Yeah, the army has bones. The army has flesh. You're so close. You're so good. You've got such amazing things. But God is going to pour out His Spirit and raise up an army that nothing can stop. All the things that have been coming against you, all the things that are trying to stop you advancing, today I break them off in the name of Jesus. And I release a fresh breath of the Spirit of God in this room. A fresh breath of the Spirit of God. Raise up a mighty army in this place. Rise up a mighty army that love you more than anything else, even their own lives, Jesus. Blow in this room. Let's worship him. Let's worship him. And as he worship him, he will come. If the leadership can help, pray for these. And we're just going to go and invite Jesus to touch us tonight, this morning.
So as some of our brothers and sisters are asked to be a minister, I'm just going to close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the word this morning, Father. Thank you for your Holy Spirit moving in our lives. In our hearts with fire and passion, Lord. Let us not be comfortable, Lord, but move us into the season, Father, where we can share with everyone about your love and your grace. And I ask you, Father, as we close this service, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for using Andrew, Father, and to deliver the word that, that have come to our hearts, Father, and we have received as your word, Lord. What you want us to be, what you want us to do, Father. We bless him, Lord, and we thank you for his life. Use him, Father. Whatever do you appoint him to go, Father, and to do, Lord, touch their lives. And right now, Father, as we depart this place, uh, those go and pick the child. I ask you, Father, that your presence never depart from our life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.